Good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday. I've been reflecting a lot this week on a couple of stories in the Hebrew Bible. I had a professor in seminary describe the Hebrew Bible as faith for the long haul because it shows a people over a long period of time discussing, debating, and describing their relationship with their God through a myriad of different circumstances. And I love that description because there are two moments in the history of the Israelite people that I've thought a lot about during this time of social distancing and quarantine. The wandering of the people in the wilderness and the exile in Babylon. On one hand, it seems odd that, that the two moments that have struck me are moments in which the people are displaced from their homes because it might seem as though it's the opposite of what we're currently experiencing with our stay at home orders being d increased indefinitely. But I don't think that's actually the case because I know for me, my house is not my home. Don't get me wrong, I love the physical space I dwell in and I'm very thankful for it. But my home is with family and friends who I'm able to share my life with. My home is the times I'm able to gather with all of you in worship and in celebration. My home is being out in the neighborhoods of San Diego, participating in the beauty of creation that surrounds us and the creativity of my neighbors in their restaurants and shops. So when I read these stories from the Hebrew Bible of a people who are uncertain of their future, worrying about their ability to take care of themselves and each other, and wondering if they need to fully adapt to this new world or if their return home will be quick, I resonate with them in a new way. I take hope that through all of their circumstances, God was with them. Through their bickering, doubt, frustration, fear, longing, joy, grief, and uncertainty, God was with them. Their circumstances may not have changed as quickly as they would have liked, but God was with them. So this week, let us hold these stories close, as we too have faith for the long haul remembering that God is with us and will continue to be with us. Let us continue in worship together through song.
Hey everyone, for our hub update today, I wanted to let you all know a little more about our community relief fund that we began a couple of weeks ago. So far we have had 19 people participate in that fund, either by giving to it or by being given funds from it. And we have been so encouraged by everyone's generosity and willingness to participate in that fund. So thank you to everyone who has so far. And along with that, as stimulus checks continue to arrive, or as you continue to have conversations about giving during this time, uh, we are absolutely still taking donations towards that fund um, as requests continue to come in, as circumstances adapt and change um, and needs arise through this time. So please continue to give towards that if you are able, and please reach out. Uh, if you are in need of assistance from that fund, we are so encouraged and happy to um, bring together those two things in this time. Thanks everyone and have a wonderful week. Happy, happy Sunday from all of me to you. I wish we were together so we could party too. Hey! This week's chalkboard question for consideration for the kids is what can we learn from living in community about God's expansive love? Parents, I invite you to read the scripture with your kids. Read a little bit about in Acts what's going on um, with the disciples while they're living in community. And go through the resource document um, that has some questions and activities to engage your kids with this conversation. And kids, we'll see you on the Zoom call at 11.30 to talk it through also. Have a good week. Hi guys, it's John and I'm going to be reading this scripture this week. It's Acts 2, uh, 42 to 47. Uh, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Tell the Bees by Sarah Lindsay. Tell the bees, they require news of the house. They must know, lest they sicken from the gap between their ignorance and our grief. Speak in a whisper, tie a black swatch to a stick and attach the stick to their hive. From the fortress of casseroles and desserts built in the kitchen these past few weeks, as though hunger were the enemy, remove a slice of cake and lay it where they can slowly draw it in, making a mournful sound. And tell the fly that has knocked on the window all day. Tell the redbird that rammed the glass from outside and stands too dazed to go. Tell the grass, though, it's already guessed, and the ground clenched in furrows. Tell the water you spill on the ground, and then all the water will know. And the last shrunken pearl of snow in its hiding place. Tell the blighted elms and the young oaks we plant instead, the water bug while it scribbles a hundred lines that dissolve behind it. The lichen, while it etches deeper its single rune. The boulders, letting their fissures widen. The pebbles, which have no more to lose. The hills, they will be slightly smaller, as always, when the bees fly out tomorrow to look for sweetness 
and find their way because nothing else has changed. So the news recently has been full of uh, footage and reports of demonstrators. 
who have been uh, protesting the stay in place orders that uh, have come to us from our government officials. And although the number of people who are actually protesting uh, this is uh, absolutely uh, minuscule compared to the number of people who are maintaining the shelter in place order, uh, that from the amount of footage that I've seen online or through social media, you wouldn't really get that sense. One of the things I think that's uh, struck me most about watching footage of these demonstrations and seeing the signs uh, that they carry, hearing what they say, is uh, that while not very well uh, explained and certainly not elucidated by their own language, all of the protests seem to sort of rotate and sort of revolve around uh, one essential idea for them. And that essential idea is this, that I am an individual, and that out of all of the individuals, I am the most important individual. It's pretty well summed up by this sign uh, that we found uh, written on the back of a car uh, driving through Maryland, I believe. It's a statement that, as you read it, it gives this impression, this understanding that the basis of all that they are saying and, and what they are protesting is that, well, they are individuals. And that not just individuals, but every single individual is the most important individual. Not only is that an absurd idea and absolutely impossible to base a society on, this idea that every single person is the most important single person out there, it's untenable. But I think what really struck me most about uh, most of what they are saying, and this idea that all of this is about the rights of an individual above all other individuals, I think what struck me the most is the absolute conspicuous absence of a certain idea. Something that is very notable by the fact that it doesn't seem to come up in these signs that these misguided people are carrying and the words that they say when they protest, whether here or Michigan or Ohio, anywhere. And it's this idea of community. It's this idea of social obligation. It's this idea that we are already part of something larger than ourselves. So much of what I see and hear from the protesters, it sort of has this uh, common idea, although everything that they say is different from each other. It all circles around this idea that the individual is what matters most, that the individual is what is most real, that the individual is the state of the natural world. And that anything beyond that, an idea of community or social obligations or a social order to which we belong and find ourselves, that all of those things, they are somehow less real. That they are more abstract than us as individuals and the bodies which comprise us as individuals in this society. Over and over, uh, the protests and signs and, and what they say, it comes back to this idea in one way or another. I am simply me, and you are simply you. And the best that we can hope for is that you never tread on my space, and that I never interfere with your rights. It's a strange way to see the world. It's a strange way to see ourselves, that at the core, that the way that we inevitably find ourselves, that that natural state of everything is that we are simply isolated individuals. And the best that we can hope for is that we don't step on each other's rights or obligations or responsibilities. It's been a strange contrast all week to look at these protester signs, to hear what they say, and to have read this scripture passage for the morning that comes to us in our lectionary. It's been an odd experience to sort of see the difference between what they've said and the picture that is presented to us in this passage from the book of Acts. Because in this chapter of the book of Acts, uh, chapter 2, it presents to us a picture of what the beginnings of the early church was like. 
what happened after Christ's death and resurrection and then ascension into heaven, when all of the disciples continued gathering and meeting and those followers of Jesus continued to sort of live in the continued hope uh, that Christ was alive, that the kingdom of God was at hand. And in this description of the early church, it describes who they were in terms of what they did. And some of the things that it describes uh, that they did with each other. It describes that they uh, worshipped together. It describes that they spent their time at the temple together. It said that they spent their time with each other in each other's homes at common tables together. It says that uh, they held all things in common And one of the ways that that showed up is that they would take all of their possessions and all of their goods, and they would sort of bring them together. And as they had them all in one place, then it was their common possessions, and that they would give to any who had need, which is important because uh, when it describes that they give to all who were in need, that word all is incredibly expansive there, meaning it wasn't just that some isolated individuals came together and they shared all of their goods uh, with each other and then only shared uh, within that small circle, but uh, the description is that they shared with everyone, even those who were not uh, did not understand themselves to be a part of that community. They gathered their things and they shared with all, anyone that they knew of in their town, in their village, in their neighborhood, in their city, in the world, who had need. And it says that they sat and they ate, they broke bread together, and they ate with glad hearts. And that sort of in summation of all of this, that they worshiped and celebrated the presence of God. Which I like how that description comes at the very end of all of these smaller descriptions of what they did, because to me, it's not just a phrase that comes at the end and says that they also worshiped God, but it is saying, I think, that it was in all of these ways that they worshiped God. Meaning, these were the ways that they recognized God's grace and love. These were the ways that they worshiped. Some in the temple, yes, other in breaking bread, and others in sharing what they had. And although the passage, it gives uh, many different uh, examples or, or explanations, these different practices that they did, I think all of those, they are just sort of pre- being presented as all of the different ways that they worshipped God. It was all ways that they were being community. In each and every description of what they did, it describes that they did them together. The word all shows up five or six different times. The word together shows up two or three different times. Uh, The passage as it creates and sort of um, paints this picture for the early church for us, these are the words that it rests on most heavily, all and together and one, as though every time that they did something, it was both a practicing and a recognition and also a celebration of who they were that they were community, first and foremost. Which is not to say that they also didn't have a sense uh, of individual gifts that they each brought, or or that some individuals had uh, things that they could give, and others had individuals uh, that they could sort of share uh, of who they were in particular ways. It's not that the idea of the individual is completely erased, but it was that this idea of individual it was one step removed from community always. Community is what was real. Community was the concrete body from which the idea of the individual was an abstraction. Even the individuals and their uh, unique gifts, when they begin to describe them in the early church, they're described in how they support and give vital life to the community how they exhort others in the community. So even the individual itself is understood in terms of how it benefits and gives and celebrates and practices the good of the community. It's a powerful idea, I think, and one, I think, that is fundamentally missed by those who are protesting right now, saying that 
their rights and liberties cannot be uh, impeded on by other people's health or vulnerability or even good. On one hand, you have an understanding that the individual is the most real, and the idea of the community is an unnecessary abstraction. And yet from the scripture, you have a very different idea, that it is community which is real. It is social responsibility and obligation, and this is what is real. And the community is what gives life. And any understanding of individual then is understood in terms of that. It's been a strange thing, I think, for all of us to experience what it's like uh, to shelter in place, uh, to be somewhat isolated during COVID-19. An odd experience because I think in some ways the trauma of what we feel also shows us something true, shows us something real, which ironically, I think the reason the protesters protest, although this is maybe not readily available to them in their consciousness, is because they feel the trauma of separation, is because they miss what community they had. And so it's ironic that the words and the language they use is this of individual when in truth, I think they are experiencing what all of us experience, which is we miss being community. We miss those ways that we practice that with each other. Because it's important, I think, to realize that the church's stance in being a community, it was not that they were saying, uh, well, we are not community and therefore we will become community. We will sort of establish that this is as real to show the rest of the world. Instead, I think it's a little different than that. The church in practicing being community was saying to the world, we are already one. We are already all in this together. And when they practiced these ways of being community, it wasn't that they were establishing uh, this sense of oneness and togetherness where it was absent. It was a way of sort of demonstrating, of being prophetic to the entire world, to anyone who looked in and had need and had things shared with them, that this is the reality already. Community is already what is. We are already together in this. Together wherever we are and in whatever situation, whatever our differences, we are part of one thing. That's a truth that I felt so much in recent days, this understanding that community is foundational, that no one is an island, as the saying goes. And I think the ways that we are missing that it's been difficult for all of us, which is perhaps the reason why we need to keep practicing community and the recognition of that in all of the ways that we can during these times, as we continue to value and uphold community, as we shelter in place in order to protect those in society that are most vulnerable to this virus. It is a recognition of community. but all of the ways that we are given to practice community in this time, to affirm its goodness, even as we so strongly feel its absence, we must hold to those. This is one of the reasons why our community resource fund that we have gathered from so many of you who have uh, given to this fund or offered to uh, uh, run and pick up groceries for those people um, who are vulnerable or who cannot go outside, uh, offered to pick up medication for those who can't go to the pharmacy on their own. Um, all of these are ways that we practice being community. It's why it's so vital, because we need to celebrate it. We need to practice it in all of the ways that we can. That's why it matters that on Sunday morning we still get up and all of us, wherever we are, we have our coffee community time over Zoom and we watch the worship service together wherever we are. As much as we can give ourselves to practice community, to celebrate it and to be it, it is good and it is nurturing and it's a reminder of what we hold to be most true and most real which is that 
we are one. We are together. And that's why this is so hard. Precisely because it is so true. Friends, I invite you to keep practicing community when and where you can. To find those ways. To reach out to each other. Because the reason that we do this, the reason why we believe this, the reason why we feel it so viscerally in these days is because we are one. And we are one for this reason. Because God so loved the world. It's expansive. It's everything. It's the cosmos. We are all loved by God. All that is has been brought through and into creation because of God's love. To say that community matters, to say that community is real, to say that the oneness of all creation, that we are given to each other in and through and for and because of love, it's not just a statement about reality. It's not just a political statement, although it is. It's a theological statement. It's about who God is. It's worship. To say and to believe and to practice and to be community. It is a reminder, a theological announcing. It is a celebration and worship of God that says we are loved. Friends, you are loved. The world is loved. Find ways to practice that, to announce it, to be community in this time that we are reminded of all of this. See you soon. <laughs>